Okay, round two. Um, we're going to get even nerdier for this presentation, so uh, if you didn't fall asleep during the zoning one, we're now going to get into building code. Um, so this is a project that started as, uh, well, the thesis work I had done uh, as an architecture student. Uh, I really thought it would just be kind of a, a, uh, a, a thesis and then it would die or someone would tell me to, to effectively shut up. Uh, but the very opposite has happened in the last two years. Uh, and so you'll see, I'll give a presentation here on work that uh, began as research and uh, as you'll learn, this is, this is now moving forwards. Um, I have good news at the national level. The Federal Building Code Commission has approved moving forward with this code change. Uh, so I might just retire entirely because after this goes through, there's not really much else I could, uh, could do to top that in life. Um, but what this is effectively is a discussion around the uh, exiting requirements in the building code. Uh, I'll move quite quickly through everything, uh, but all the information is on the website. I, I seem to like making websites for stuff uh, called secondegress.ca. Um, so if you miss anything or want to follow up, go there. Uh, also, I'll be around for a few minutes afterwards to discuss things. Feel free to send me an email uh, if you're curious. So um, in 1993, which is about 30 years ago now, uh, a very famous Toronto architect, Eb Zeidler, wrote an article uh, where he talks about the sort of main streets, avenues, mid-rise zoning that was happening, and two particular issues that were going to be barriers to this. Uh, parking minimums is one, and as all I think many of us know, parking minimums have now been erased. And the other one is the building code requirement for two exits. And he writes an article where he compares this to the way in which mid-rise buildings are built in Europe, where only one stair is required. As far as I can tell, this is the first example of this advocacy in Canada, and I'm pleased to say that 30 years later, uh, we're finally doing something to address this. Uh, on the note of missing middle, I, my definition probably varies a bit from other people's definitions. I think given it's called missing middle, it should include mid-rise, and we don't build a lot of mid-rise. Um, so I always pull up this diagram from the city of Edmonton, which I think gives a fairly good description of what we're talking about. The code change is intended to, uh, to really address this scale of building, is to do two, three things. One is to make missing middle buildings easier to build. Two is to make them feasible on smaller lots. And that leads to three, which is that you can, um, uh, they're feasible with without the land acquisition and large capital requirements um, to do a mid-rise currently. Uh, I'll also just talk, of course, about the note of exclusionary zoning. I think that now that we've made these building types legal, things like this building code issue will become more apparent as we're now actually going to be trying to build them. And so this is the Canadian National Building Code. We're in Ontario, which of course uh, has its own building code, but the requirement is identical. For part nine buildings and part three buildings, we allow two stories at most. Um, I'm not going to read this out, but uh, it's all available there. And the research that I've done started off by looking at the Canadian requirement and comparing this to other jurisdictions. Uh, I'm an architect. I've worked in Japan, in Germany, uh, in several different offices in Canada, and have seen the differences in the way mid-rise and small apartment buildings are designed and just what an influence this requirement has, especially um, considering the number of sort of double-loaded corridor floor plans that we do in Toronto. And so what you'll see is uh, Canada is the second most restrictive jurisdiction in the world. When I had started this research, uh, we, we kind of liked, at the time, discovering that Canada was the most restrictive jurisdiction. But I've since learned that Uganda uh, has a more restrictive building code. Uganda requires any building with more than a ground floor to have two exits. I don't know if people in Uganda are actually building that way but we are now second most restrictive. So I'll zoom in on this graph a bit. Countries like Switzerland, South Korea, uh, and the UK uh, until this year did not have a maximum building height restriction. Uh, you'll see countries like Germany, China, France, Sweden are all around the kind of even high rise 10, 12, 15 story mark. Uh, and I will discuss the Grenfell Tower, which is a, a disaster and a tragedy that happened in the UK in 2017 shortly. What you'll also notice is there's a, a clustering of countries and jurisdictions around the sort of six to eight story mark, which happens to coincidentally align with the typical ladder reach of a typical fire department ladder truck. 
the U.S. is at actually three stories, although the National Fire Protection Association's uh, model building code allows up to four stories. And then we have Canada, which is at two stories, which is lower than the, very, the same height of the ladder, the, the um, hand ladder that most fire trucks have. Uh, in 2008, uh, the BC Building Code Department, as they were working on increasing the height for wood frame construction, commissioned a study from a very good fire protection engineer to look at what was the historical rationale in the building code for these things around area and height. And what they found was that a lot of our code requirements, which still exist today, are over 100 years old and based on assumptions from that time, at a time when things like the methods of construction, the degree of compartmentation between units, uh, the way that we did interior finishes, we do drywall now, back then we didn't do a lot of drywall, uh, evacuation systems and design, uh, the behavior of people during fires hadn't really been understood or studied at the time, we also didn't have cell phones to call the uh, fire department rather quickly. And the way that firefighting was done and the equipment that firefighters had 100 years ago was vastly different from today. And the building code requirement at two stories for single stair is 100 years old. So I'll speak briefly about the Grenfell Tower because anytime I have this discussion, uh, some concern is raised by a building official or a, a fire chief um, that this is crazy. I will remind you the Grenfell Tower was a 24-story building at 60 meters in height. It was not sprinklered. Uh, there, um, in 2017, a kitchen fire spread to the facade of the building in which they used a cladding material that is illegal in this country. Um, and 70, more than 70 people died in that fire. Uh, the building had a stay put fire, firefighting policy. What that means is that in order to not overwhelm the single exit, you're supposed to remain in your dwelling unit. And the concept is that the fire protection measures are sufficient that you could stay in the dwelling unit uh, and fire would not spread. In the case of this, this disaster, by the, from the time the fire department had arrived on site, they didn't uh, declare evacuate, i.e. Don't, don't follow the stay put policy for more than 80 minutes. So in addition to the building not being sprinklered, having illegal cladding, being 24 stories, and the stay put policy remaining in place for more than 80 minutes, 72 people died. The point I'm trying to make is that the code change we are talking about, as you'll see, is vastly different from this. It is apples to oranges. Uh, in the past two years, interestingly, since the work that I had done was published, uh, uh, there was initially a, a review of the Grenfell disaster in which several new requirements were introduced. Requiring two exit stairs for these high-rise buildings was not one of those requirements. In the last two years since this work has been published, the uh, Royal Institute of British Architects, the London Fire Brigade, a number of articles have been uh, published to suggest that maybe we should revisit those requirements. And as of this year, they are now proposing to introduce a requirement for two stairs above 30 meters in height. And so it's been very interesting to see the research that I have been doing in Canada to raise our limit also impact uh, doing the op moving in the opposite direction in the UK. Uh, and so this is again the proposal for the uh, maximum building height that's being discussed in the UK. And a lot of good, good research is being done by fire protection engineers in the UK to demonstrate why that might be an appropriate height. Uh, another jurisdiction I'll talk quickly about is Germany. Germany has very good fire uh, statistics and uh, building codes. Uh, in the city of Berlin and, well, kind of across Germany, the threshold to require two exit stairs is 22 meters in building height. That's about eight stories. And the concept there is, uh, is that you, you actually require two means of egress. However, the second egress or exit can be a balcony or window which is designed to be accessed by the ladder of the fire department. Problem with this, of course, is that you then have to design for that. Trees, overhead wires, these things become issues. And so what the German code also says is that if you cannot provide a second exit, if you cannot either have two stairs or a balcony as area of refuge and escape, you can have a single stair so long as that stair is positively pressurized, which is to um, blow air into it so that smoke cannot infiltrate, and you provide a fire separation to it. And then if we're 22 meters in height, they also have an additional um, conditions that you can increase that to 60 meters so long as the floor area is limited. And so this is, what's, this is a graphic that comes out of the sort of manual on building codes in Germany that gives a really good sense of the economies of scale that exist in the German code uh, for different building heights. 
uh, to allow for single stair on tight, small infill conditions. Uh, and one of the projects I'll show, this is actually something that uh, Alex Bozikovic, the Global Mail's architecture critic, describes as precisely the, dumb, the kind of dumb box you would need to solve a housing crisis. It's a four-story building, 13, 44 by 44 feet. You could pretty much put this on any one of those lots in Scarborough. Um, it was, it's prefab modular uh, wood frame construction with a non-combustible stair uh, built in about a month. Um, here's the floor plan of it, you'll see the single stair, an incredible flexibility in unit layouts and reconfigurations that you could achieve with this type of floor plan. Um, and it's, I always struggle to just show one or two precedents or examples because there are literally thousands if not millions of these types of buildings. We have to realize that the rest of the world except Canada builds this way. Canada and the US to some degree. Uh, and so if we're not going to change our code, someone needs to give me a really good answer, why not? And so far, um, there's been quite an encouraging response. One thing I'll say about Germany, and this is a kind of stupid uh, uh, anecdotal way of describing things, is in Germany you can build a building to 60 meters with a single stair, and you can go on the Autobahn and drive 300 kilometers an hour. If we take that comparison to Canada, where you can effectively build a building at six meters in height with single stair, our highways should have a speed limit of 30 kilometers an hour. But they don't. And so what I think, think that speaks to is the cultural acceptance we have in this country of road deaths versus building deaths, and the different regulatory regimes that we have impacting that. Uh, so I can talk a lot about Europe and Asia and other jurisdictions, uh, but that sometimes falls on deaf-blind ears because we're in North America. What's really interesting is the city of Seattle uh, and New York City have their own building codes. And the city of Seattle, since 1977, has a building code that says you can build single stair, wood frame construction, mid-rise buildings up to six stories with one stair. These are those requirements, a maximum of four dwelling units per floor. That means that the travel distance from your door to the stair would be quite limited. Uh, the building has to be sprinklered, which for part three buildings we do anyways. And the stairwell has to be pressurized, which is something typically you don't do until you're above six stories, to prevent smoke from infiltrating the stair. It's a really smart code, and there's many, many examples of these buildings being built in Seattle, um, which otherwise wouldn't be feasible. One of those which I like talking about is actually a co-housing project where the architect uh, developed it in partnership with um, uh, uh, the other future residents. It's a single stair, you'll see the courtyard in the middle. This lot is, uh, Christ, it's 50 by 120, 130 feet, I think. Really the size of a typical Main Street's um, lot. And uh, when I'd interviewed and talked to the architect, he said, you know, we had actually tested a design with uh, two stairs and we would have lost uh, three dwelling units. And I think it's really interesting because you can start to see both the, the efficiency of the design in terms of floor air efficiency, the cross ventilation and daylight that you're getting from both sides, um, and just the quality of space that a floor plan like this creates. These are a couple images of that courtyard. What's really interesting here is um, it's an exterior corridor that then goes back into interior, interior stair. And so the concerns like uh, maintenance around snow or rain and liability in the stair are dealt with by the stair being internalized. But the corridor is exterior. And from a firefighting perspective, that's very good because if smoke leaves your dwelling unit, you know, it's not being caught in a corridor, the exterior stair actually allows that smoke to ventilate out. And hence, from a firefighting perspective, this is a very, very good design. Uh, the, the architects had done this little drawing, which I think probably is the single most compelling drawing that one could do to convey the benefits of a single stair design, um, and really speaks to the kind of livability and quality of space benefits of something like this. And so now we'll get into the code change submission that we submitted last year. Uh, I had submitted in partnership with David Hine Engineering, who's uh, one of the best, if not the best, fire protection engineer in the province of Ontario. Um, and uh, we had submitted that in April to the Canadian Commission on Building and Fire Codes. Again, our building code is broken into two categories, part three for buildings over three stories and part nine for up to three stories. Uh, the language we had used was significantly based off of the requirements that Seattle has, given Seattle has a similar history of wood frame construction. Um, and one of the things that we had added in is uh, through looking at jurisdictions like Germany, Sweden, Japan, uh, more than 30 different countries around the world, 
Um, I've become very good at using Google Translate and calling everybody I know who speaks a foreign language to help me f figure these things out, is the Canadian Building Code has a, an interesting uh, condition which says that the dwelling unit, the wall between the corridor and the dwelling unit has to have a fire rating of one hour. But the door in that wall can be built to only 20 minutes, effectively compromising the performance of that fire separation. These other jurisdictions say that the door in that wall should perform like the wall it is in. Perhaps one of the reasons we require two exits is because we compromise our fire separations with these door requirements. And so one of the things we have proposed is in addition to the requirements Seattle has, because Canada as a conservative culture tends to always have to go one up everyone else on safety, which is a good thing, um, is to require the d dwelling unit doors to perform like the walls they are in. Uh, and then I'll talk briefly about the Part 9 code change request, which is effectively to match what is in the, um, let's say, arrogantly named International Building Code. So the U.S.'s building code is called the International one, even though only the U.S. and a couple of countries who didn't want to spend the money on making their own building code use it. Um, and it is to uh, use the same conditions as that, which is, again, to say that you can have up to four dwelling units uh, served by a single stair in buildings of up to three stories. For things like multiplexes, this would make a huge impact on the, uh, on the floor area efficiency and feasibility of your project. Uh, and so, as I presented earlier today, this was the rehousing uh, scope of work where we had looked at things like stacked townhouses where each dwelling unit has its own entrance versus something like a Montreal type triplex with three units. Um, you know, if you're in a wheelchair, if you're old and you don't want to walk upstairs anymore, uh, having a code that allows and accommodates and incentivizes doing designs that aren't just stacked townhouses might be a good idea. And yeah, this is, this is just a quick comparison of sort of how that exiting would resolve itself. And so after completing this research, uh, a, a several dozen architects, Jennifer Kiesmat, the former chief planner of the city of Toronto, Brad, Bad, Brad Bradford, who's running for mayor. A lot of people uh, co-signed a letter that I wrote to the Housing Affordability Task Force. They included our recommendation in their report to the province. And uh, Steve Clark, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, wrote a letter to the uh, Building Code Commission requesting that the work on this code change be prioritized, recognizing uh, its benefits. Um, and so this is that code change overlaid onto that initial diagram. Uh, as you can see, um, uh, it's kind of impact on, on making these types of projects in the missing middle feasible. Um, and it's been a whirlwind in the past year of, of giving presentations, meeting people, a um, lot, uh, lot of interest from builders and developers and planners and architects in BC and in Ontario. Uh, and hopefully we see this code changed um, for the next cycle of the building code. Uh, it's now essentially out of my hands, um, but uh, I'm excited we've gotten this far. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, well, Conrad. And I'll, I'll just add, uh, if you want to follow uh, where this is going, feel free to follow me on Twitter, um, because I'm constantly shit posting on there as well, <laughs> mostly about building codes. Amazing.